Midweek in the coal house. It's all fingers and thumbs at the munitions factory. I'm not doing it every day for a month. Gas masks provide some unlikely entertainment. Are we making silly noises? And there's a shortage of men down the mine. Families to feed, quotas to meet. Um, very, very tough, very hard work. Three families have stepped back in time, living life in the South Wales coal valleys of 1944. They're getting used to wartime rations and the rigours of work, home and school, but their war efforts are only just starting and life will get tougher. Crammed into number six stack square are the Tranter Davis family, whose five daughters have been joined by evacuees Caleb and Kia. At number seven stack square, the Griffiths boys with mum, gran and grandad and at number eight with their four young children are the Paisies. This is the BBC Home Service News, read by Reginald Bradshaw. Allied troops making for the Siegfried Line have crossed the River Mosul and have beaten off fierce resistance. Another early start in Stack Square. In the crowded Tranter Davis household, evacuee Caleb has had a restless first night. I'm missing my mum and my dad and my little brother Jay, so it's quite a bit empty inside, but um, I got my sister, so I'll be okay. Laura, whose grandmother took in wartime evacuees, does her best to make Caleb and sister Kia feel at home with a hearty breakfast. A bit too hearty. There's been a porridge disaster. Well, it went from water with some oats in it to the biggest load of porridge I've ever seen. News travels fast to their neighbours, the Griffiths. Ladders, porridge is blown. And all of a sudden it just went, no. It's gone all over half the shows. Oh, my it's God. Even porridge oats were in short supply in 1944, so nothing is wasted, despite some reluctance. It needs sugar. It needs more sugar? Well, it is. It's water and oats, mostly. Are you serious? Yeah. The wartime diet is having some unwelcome side effects. That's just not human. <laughs> well, it is the biggest poo I've ever seen, particularly coming out of a small <laughs> child. <laughs> no, I can't. I'll go later. Seriously? The biggest poo one. I've ever seen. It's bigger than him. <laughs> <laughs> There's a damp feeling at the Paisies. But my suit from yesterday is still sodden. And we've had that in, in front of the fire since about three o'clock. And the fire was going well all day. Still wet. 57-year-old ex-miner Howell is up early and battling with a bad chest. Hopefully today will be a better day. So just clear my chest. I mean, just been for a walk up there too. Try to clear the chest of it, you know? <coughs> There's no time to clean up the morning's mayhem before the men and women head off to work. Today, the workers have the luxury of a bus to save their feet, but it's come at a cost. Three shillings each out of their weekly pay packets. First thing at school, the children face a grim lesson in wartime life. Today, we are going to practice putting on our gas masks. When I say one, you take out your masks. One. The threat of poison gas had subsided by 1944, but most children still had to carry their mask at all times, Then, know how to put it on, and could be punished for forgetting it. When I say two, put on your mask. Two. Two. Make sure they are fitting properly. Breathe normally as if nothing is happening at all. The class of Stack Square soon discover an alternative use for the gas masks. <laughs> the women arrive for work at the munitions factory. I need two ladies. 
Potentially dangerous and full of high explosives, it was important to control who and what went in and out. No laughing matter for tens of thousands of women employed in munitions factories during the war. The coal house women will be sewing ammunition bags, a precise art they need to grasp quickly. I knew I should have paid more attention at needlework class in school. The sooner the women master the sewing machine, the more they'll earn. And that's easier said than done when they can't even manage a straight line. Absolutely brilliant. That's excellent. Thank you, Mrs. Jones. You've really got enough to chew the sewing. But Laura Tranter Davis is proving quite the expert. Is it right? Yes, it's lovely. So do I pass? You do. Coal was essential to the war effort, and in 1944 was in short supply. At Blind Tulare, all the men need further training before they're even ready for the coal face. Hey there, men. Is it my pit all the men, Mr. Jones? I leave you in his hands. You do as you're told, listen to me, and I'll make you colliers. It's a lot more fun with the pickaxe than the shoveling coal that we were doing yesterday. You, you're going to have to have little breaks throughout the day. I don't think anybody could actually do this non-stop, you know, constantly swinging for a whole day. With the men getting dirty and nappies piling up, Natalie Paisy's taking the plunge with the washing machine. Yeah, right. yeah. Oxidol is ideal for washing machines. Follow maker's instructions. I don't think it comes with instructions. Oh, enough is better than too much. New mod cons with a housewife saviour. That's Steve's pants in, because they look disgusting. And they need a good wash. Shall I start it to see what happens? Oh, it's too late. Oh, no. <laughs> this is better than a TV. <laughs> Nineteen forty four school dinner. Not going down well. Do you like peas, Ewan? I know. You don't like peas. Do you like potato? Yeah. Right, I'll tell you what we'll do then is we'll pull all the potato to one side and you can eat the bits of potato. War fostered a strong community spirit, and back at Stack Square, Rose Griffiths has raced through her own chores and is ready to tackle her neighbour's porridge problem. So I thought I'd just come in and just do a quick tidy. That there's some form of normality for her. Bless her. So we've got the boiler on. Oh, do you like my... <laughs> How about that for sexy legs? <laughs> the relentless pace has left Rose in need of extra support. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I can't wait to get my corset on <laughs> because my back is killing me. <laughs> 1944 is bleeding well hard and I wish I could go out to work because they had it easy. It's the poor old mummies and the nannies that have to stay in to clean up the house tidy for them because the Welsh have got very, very proud house values. So, you know, we've got to keep up to that standard. Whereas if they can go out to work and work in a factory, they can sit down and enjoy all day and come back and have a home-cooked meal. So, with a bit of luck, Mandy will get sucked. <laughs> and Mandy is struggling. Look, I'm getting there. That would have been perfect until I got to there. That much. Mm, gentle. But it's 17-year-old Annie Starr who's really feeling the strain. You can see her temper's just about to go. She's not getting to grips with it at all. <laughs> I'm not doing it every day for a month. Swap there, you do it. Swapped. She doesn't like it because for once I've got something right. Yeah, get off. I mind. <laughs> Hundreds of attempts later, and Annie's finally sewn one straight line. Excellent. Take that to Mrs. Roberts now. Honey. I told you you'll make your own wedding dress, <laughs> didn't I? You're going to sew them all like Anna. Well done. Well done. At the pit, Howell's struggling with his chest, but he's the only one who knows what mining really entails. I worked in the old Ammerford colliery, and that was hard work. That was all shoveling, sweat, 
and that's something I will never forget. Watch him using the mandrel. He'll show how to hit it. You don't pick at it, hit it. It won't hit you back. <laughs> After a testing shift, the women are glad to be on the bus home. <laughs> Myself now, I feel like I'm making a contribution to, to the war effort. You know, not just stuck in the house doing, you know, cooking for the kids, making sure everything's tidy and doing everything. It was nice to go out and think, yeah, I'm achieving something for the war effort. <laughs> and I think we've broken down. <laughs> Mechanical breakdowns were common in 1944. Spare parts were in short supply, so it's a two-mile walk back to Stack Square. Hey there, man. Enjoy your walk home. What about the bus, uh, Mr. Blanford? The bus is broken down. Off we go, then. Yet again, the men are forced to walk the four miles home. It's a further test for Howell. On top of a day's work, Laura Tranter Davis has been dreading a return to her porridge nightmare. Oh, oh, oh. I am going to cry. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> I said that you'd had a tough old time of it this morning. Least I can do. <laughs> You haven't had time even so much as to brush the floor of him. <laughs> the exhausted men return from work to yet another wartime job. <coughs> the coal house families are sharing an allotment full of nutritious vegetables. That's enough there now. The government encouraged people to dig for victory and in 1944, a million tons of veg was grown in allotments and gardens. They can't just go to the supermarket and get what they need. It's nice to bring them here for them to see how much work is involved. I found those capsules and those capsules. I think they were useful because I love the way they move. And, and I used to have some, just it turned into a moth and it flew off. Wish me luck as you wave me goodbye. Cheerio, here I go on my way. Like thousands of wartime evacuees, Caleb is struggling to come to terms with life away from home. The other children are getting used to no mod cons and are making their own entertainment. But for the women, the pressure of coal house life is taking its toll. Like the difference in the lifestyle is, is the time factor. Where, you know, in 2008 you can have the washing machine going whilst you're doing something else, whilst something is cooking. Here it's, um, you know, it's very difficult to multitask. Give me a big kiss and a hug. I love you. Do you love Mummy? Yeah. How much? All the world and more. All the world and more. Let's go. I haven't even got time to talk to them. I just seem to bark orders, really. It's just too much to do to to enjoy the time that they're enjoying as well. They're loving it. They're having a really good time. But I don't get time to read her a story because there's always stuff to do. Another meal and more tears in the Paisy house. Yeah. I do like that. Oh, tea. Well, the colours of the really? is... At the Trent of Davises, Geraint's getting ready for his first Home Guard training. Over a million men volunteered for the Home Guard, all eager to play their part in fighting the enemy. After a day taking orders at Mr Blanford's mine, Stack Square Battalion are in for a shock when they find out who'll be calling the shots tonight. Lieutenant Blanford, new arrivals. Glad you could make it. Cup of ward. Yes, sir. First man. Here's your helmet. Thank you. There's your net. Put it in your pocket. You'll need it later. And there's your haversack. Thank you. And there's your mess tins. One torch. In working order. Thank you very much. 
Here's your bayonet. Don't open it now, it's really sharp. And this is your rifle. Right, fall in! Thomas, right marker facing that way. Come on, you guys, fall in. Single file. It might be a challenge too far to turn the men of Stack Square into a crack fighting force. Right, for you new men, we'll talk through a few things. Put your right arm up on the man next to you and look to the right. So that's called dressings. Right, and then push yourself so your arm is straight. Right, keep your arms up and look to the right. Right, you should be seeing just the tip of his chin. If you're too far forward, move back. If you can't see it, move forward. The same with you and him. You, this guy, you and him, and you and him. Right, when I say eyes front, I want you to bring your right arm down to your side without slapping your leg, and look straight to your front towards me. Eyes front! The stay-at-home soldiers didn't escape from strict discipline. 48 hours of compulsory duty each month and regular inspections from the divisional captain. No razor blades in the village? No, sir, just not enough time, sir. Not enough time. There's always time, isn't there, Son Hayes? Always Certainly time. Yes, and I'll find time for this young man. What's your name? Griffiths, sir. Griffiths. Look down, Griffiths. Straight away. Now, you tried to distract me with your beard and your moustache, but I'll still pick you up for your boots. Yes, sir. Look at them boots. Two things with them boots. Firstly, yeah, they're dirty. Secondly, they're not waterproof. Make sure you get loads and loads of polish. Son Hayes? OK, Griffiths. Yeah? Let's have ten for the king. Get on the floor. Yes, sir. One, two, count them out. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sometimes it seems a bit daft, but it's it's part of the army way, and so we've got to got to do it, really. Thank you very much, Your Majesty. Thank you very much, Your Majesty. No problem, Griffiths. Sullivan soldier. <laughs> Back at home, the women have to knit socks and jumpers for the troops, a popular social pastime in 1944. I'm suddenly 12 years of age again, sitting in my granny's cottage, and she showed me how to knit you. Over 300,000 British servicemen were killed during the Second World War, and Mandy Griffiths, whose husband is away on active service in 2008, has real empathy with the wives of 1944. You're thinking of things, you're thinking, oh, what is it going to be like in work tomorrow? And I was my husband doing out there, and I wonder what he's thinking now and what he's doing now. And I get a little bit emotional, I'm not going to cry again. <laughs> it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. It's been an emotional and exhausting 17 hour day for the Stack Square families, but someone's keeping an eye on them. The air raid warden, ensuring lights are out. A new day, and another cold and early start in the Tranter Davis's cottage. We had a lovely fire yesterday morning, and this morning it wouldn't catch at all. So I was up about, well, I was up at half past five getting it sorted out, and it just wouldn't catch, so then I had to let it go out a little bit, to clean it out a second time, and to light it a second time. Next door at the Griffiths, Grandmother Rose is having more luck. Our fire hasn't gone out yet, but now that I've said that, guaranteed it will. Morning. Morning. So I think you're enjoying your little domain here, aren't you? Well, yes, I am, but I would like to get out now. <laughs> Sorry, sweetheart, I'm hoping the shop will be open today. I wasn't open yesterday. You made my Waste not, want not means the Paisies have to swallow their oats, lumps and all. <laughs> I slept upstairs with the children last night because Lara was in bed with Steve. You were not having giggling in his sleep. It was so sweet. So obviously, he was having a good dream, which means he's quite happy. <coughs> Howell, the oldest man in Stack Square, is still battling his bad chest, knowing the other men are depending on him at the mine. But with the bus now repaired, he can at least enjoy a quick, dry journey to work. Please be so kind as to collect the lunch money now. Okay. Can I have your lunch, thank you? Well, let me just check. One, two, In 1944, five. most children paid for meals, but it seems the Paisy clan have been sent to school penniless. We forgot our dinner money. You forgot your dinner money? Yeah. Isabel, will you be so kind as to give this letter to your mother and your father? I'm expressing my disappointment of the lack of money today. Off you go, please, children. Surprising news greets the men at the mine. We've got a little bit of a coal shortage on our orders going out. <coughs> so, uh, today, some of you, if not all of you, will be going underground. 
been listening to your chest this morning. Not happy for you to go underground. We'll be staying on the surface with supplies. Uh, see if your chest improves tomorrow. And we'll see if you can go underground tomorrow. Right, man, you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Be very mindful of where you're going. But into a very, very dangerous working environment. Listen to the colleagues who are around you. You're quite safe. I think it's, it's rather harsh on uh, Howell, who's most experienced out of all of us and has been giving us tips all the way through the training. And hopefully his chest will clear up. We'll be relying on him uh, and his experience down there because um, we, because uh, Geraint and I have none really. I am writing to express my dislike. I got children came to school say that their lunch money. I'm terrible at that. <laughs> Pennies in pocket, the children head obediently back to school, but they pay the 1944 price for forgetfulness. Lines during break time. Another shift at the munitions factory. And now that everyone's mastered seams and straight lines, the inspector is upping the ante. It's going to be 30 an hour. An hour? Compared to Mandy and my mother, I think I'll do pretty well because they do nothing, they just talk all the time. I think we are going to have to be a little bit more serious. I'm having real problems with the machine. What have you done to your machine? I haven't done working? anything to it. There's no way that you can target. Well, 30 an hour is not that difficult, so no. you should still be able to do it. Fine, now. In the factories of 1944, teams were expected to make as many as 500 ammunition bags each day. Army standards have slipped quite a bit this morning, but Mandy's is uh, excellent. Really good. Without the expertise of Howell, Stephen and Geraint brave their first journey to the coalface. It's cold, wet, alien and claustrophobic. This point you're about 70 metres of mountain above your head. I'm going to have room to take my jacket off if I get in there. All right, Mr Jones, two new men for you. Leave them in your capable hands, show them what to do. Okay. So all you've got to do is use the mandrel and work it off. Follow what I'm telling you? Yeah. Okay. And you've got eight yards of coal face to do every day. From there, for eight yards along. This is quite possibly the hardest work I've ever done. Certainly a lot harder than my normal job of sending emails. I'll be able to work closely as a team down here. Um, the professionals in here obviously do. Let's come in. Looking for that one. Not the most pleasant working conditions, is it? Kneeling in cold water. In 1944, Welsh miners cut 22 million tonnes of coal. It wasn't enough. Can't really get at it without shoveling get on. <laughs> On the surface, Howell feels out in the cold. Frustrated that I can't go underground and I'm doing this instead. Here I am, qualified collier, up sunshine miner, as they say. Sunshine miner. But uh, no, I'm not happy at all. Back at Stack Square, it's been a long day for Howell's wife, Rose. She's been on the go since six and wants to clock off. You get that room done, you think, oh God. You haven't got the washing out, so you stick the washing out. Then you've got to think forward. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Next door, two-year-old Lara Paisy is determined to throw a spanner in her mum's work. Lara went off this morning with my handbag. I can't find it anywhere. And it's got our identity cards in it. It hasn't got our ration books in it, thankfully. It's in the shed. It's with the pigs. I'm not getting any sense out of her. We're going to go on a hunt, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Where's Mummy's bag? In the... Show. Found it. You found it just miraculously in a nest. We were you did one it. did it. Oh. It's been a long and unproductive shift 
for Geraint and Stephen. In 1944, production was way below target, and the government was concerned about the lack of fit young men to work underground. Bit wet yes. on there? Bit soggy, bit cramped. Penny of height? Got all our fingers. Huh? Yeah, got, got all right. our fingers still. Went all right then, yeah. Jam, yeah. Hard work there between uh, the pit props. How much coal did you shovel out? Oh, tons, man. Uh, tons? About a bag full. <laughs> uh, about a bag full. As the men finally make their way home, they're in for a surprise. Where's number five? There's number five. There are new arrivals at Stack Square. Four young men have been ordered by the government to work in the understaffed mine. They'll be living at number five, and their arrivals already caused a stir. They may be smiling now, but with no experience of physical labour, let alone life underground, they could be in for a shock. In the next coal house, the women are found in a compromising position at work. The traditional education causes a stink, and the boys get down and dirty in preparation for the mine.